Sunday scripture reading is taken from Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Thank you, Troy. Well, ready or not, here it comes. <laughs> so we're inside the boat today, and uh, if you'll come to VBS, it's going to be a great time being able to learn a lot about Jonah and really a lot about ourselves. Um, Seven o'clock tomorrow night, uh, scenes will change each time, and we've got some great actors, in spite of Joshua. <laughs> We've got some great actors and some great hams, so whichever one, uh, it'll be a good time, and you'll get to see the story and, and watch kids and all kinds of things. And Evan Todorchin is going to be here to teach the adult class, so that's going to be a great thing for all of you who are here to listen to him as well. So let me just ask you this morning, did you ever feel like running away? Did you ever decide, you know what, I've just had enough of this, there is just too much going on, all these people demanding so many things of me. Fortunately, you can send most of them to Bible Hour. <laughs> and, and you just want to get rid of things, and it's just too much. Because we do that to ourselves, don't we? We think we can handle all these things, and all of the stuff that's going on, and then there's more and more and more and more until it just gets to be more than what we want, and we're just tired of it all. And we just don't know how to handle it all. And we get overwhelmed. And there's a lot of different kinds of running away that we're going to look at this morning. Jonah's the first one as we begin to look at what that means. Jonah's the one who is a prophet of God. He's one who understands that. He's not a new prophet of God. He's been a prophet of God. There's been other times where God has asked him to prophesy. We understand it's not a new position that he has. But, you know, at this point and particular time in his life, and I don't know why it is, perhaps it's the city, perhaps it's what he has to say, but he just decides, nope, I am not going to go. And so prophets were given a message. They didn't get to just you know, get up and preach anything they wanted to. They had to say what God said. Um, preachers are supposed to do the same thing. It's not just getting up and saying anything you want to. It ought to come out of the Bible, and it ought to be something that God's trying to say. And so we get those situations where you're trying to say something God wants you to say, and it's really not about you. And Jonah, for this, for whatever reason is told to go out and cry against Nineveh because it's evil and God wants them to repent and he decides I'm not going to go. Now Nineveh is about 500 miles to the east so maybe it's a matter of travel and he doesn't want to go that far or travel that far and you know but I don't think that really can be it because he decides he's going to go to Tarshish and Tarshish is Spain it's like 2,000 miles to the west and so it's a much greater distance there, so it can't be about the travel. Maybe it's about the message. He doesn't like to condemn people because his message is very condemning. Forty days and you guys are all going to die. And that's, that's the message. And he seems to be very good at delivering it. He does a shortened version. It's a three-day walk through the city. He only does one. Uh, I guess they got the message. But we'll look at that more this week, and I know you're going to be able to see Evan and, and talk with him about all of that. But sometimes I think we make excuses. I don't want to do that, so I'll just stall a little bit. 
I'll just be late. I'll just not quite show up on time. Jonah doesn't do any of that. He just says, nope, not going to do it. And then he decides to go the other way. As if somehow he could run away from it and not have to do it by escaping God. Well, he knows there's not really a way to escape God. I don't think he's thinking he's going to get completely away from God. But if he's nowhere in the vicinity of Nineveh, then obviously it's not going to work and he doesn't have to do it. So he can be far, 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 far away. And he should know better than that because God has a way of dealing with us when we decide we don't want to do what he wants. Especially when we've already signed up for it. Especially when we've already said we are a Christian. Now maybe if we'd never said we're a Christian, we don't want to be a Christian. We have no relationship with you whatsoever, God. He tends not to count on us. But you know, when you've said you're a prophet of God, when you've said you're a Christian, when you've said you live for God, you speak for God, you follow God, then I think maybe God expects us to. And so that's where this whole story comes together. And it's not okay for us to just run away. I decided I don't like the message. I don't like the people. I don't want to go. I don't want to travel. I don't want to do this. For whatever reason, he's deciding I don't want this whatsoever at all. And he decides I'm not going to do it. And so I would rather end my relationship with God than to go and do this. And so he is leaving the presence of the Lord. However, when you do that, there are consequences. And he puts you in a situation where you might need him. And that's what happens to us. We're running away in protest. We're running away because we don't agree with the actions, with the decisions. We're running away for a lot of different reasons. We don't think that something is going right or doing right or some problem with some person. And so we decide, I'm going to leave God. I've never quite understood that. But I guess it's because then you can be out of the vicinity of where that person is. But it's really strange when we decide that, you know, we're mad at somebody else and we're going to leave God. Well, God isn't the one you're mad at. But that's what we tend to do is we decide I'm going to run away from God. Not just the person, not the task, but I'm going to run completely away from God. I don't want to be in his presence. I'm not going to worship. I'm not going to do anything that he says. And it could be that Jonah has some premonition of the political things that are going to be happening, but that's much, much later. Uh, Assyria is going to be the, comp the com country that is going to actually come and capture Israel. But you still got a hundred years or more, and they're not a superpower then. They're, they haven't grown up then. And so this is what will get them ready for that so that God is able to bless them. But that hasn't happened yet. And so perhaps Jonah knows that much in advance. Or perhaps, you know, that's really kind of a stretch to be able to say, yes, he knew that and understood all of that. We just know that he runs away from God. And by that, he thinks he can get away from the task. See, the point comes down to this. We don't, we don't know God. And we want to have control of our own life. We don't want him to have control of our own life. I want to do what I can, what I want to do on my own, what I think, what's best for me, my own will, my own rights. And I don't want to do what I don't want to do. And I can do whatever I want. Basically, Jonah does not want them to repent because that's what would have happened. Have you ever been there? You're kind of mad at somebody and you really wish God would punish them. You hope bad things happen to them. You know, the, maybe you've seen some of the things on TV where a person comes by and yells at somebody for something that wasn't their fault. And they're all mad and upset and they run into a telephone pole. 
And it just makes you want to laugh out loud and say, ah, there is some kind of karma justice going on. And no, that's not where we need to be. But sometimes we get there, don't we? And, and we end up, well, you know, I don't like that person. I don't want to be them. It's, it's childish. It's immature. I don't want to be around them. So why doesn't he want them to repent? Not really sure, other than the fact that they would have God's favor then. And at this point, Israel doesn't. And even though he's been a prophet, and even though he's had the message of God, and he's taken that message to Israel, Israel has not repented. And now he's going to be sent to Nineveh. Maybe he thinks it won't do any good there. But he doesn't want them to repent. We can see it from his anger at the end of the story. And so come for Jonah this week. VBS is going to be fun. It's going to be something. But I want you to realize in the beginning, you cannot run away from God. It is not going to work. But there's some other times where people ran away. Um, sometimes we want to run away from good. And we want to run towards sin. The prodigal son is one of those stories. Luke 15, verse 11 says, And he said there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had, and he took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property with a reckless living. It almost seems like he's oppressed by his father, right? Have you ever known teenagers, been a teenager? They all think this. Okay, I always thought this too. I mean, that's what happens at that age. It's, it's where you are in life. You think you're grown up and you should control your life. And somebody else thinks they can tell you what to do. Why would they think that? And this isn't what I want. And he decides, you know what? I want to, I'm tired of being good. I'm tired of doing right. And, you know, my dad is good. My brother is good. And I just, you know, there's that city over there. And it just looks like such a great place. I know there's, there's great things going on there. It's so much fun. And I hear stories about people who are having so much fun there. Of course, you never hear about the consequences. You just hear about all the fun and he doesn't want to obey. And so he can't do it on his own. So he asks for his father to help. And sure enough, the father helps. And he runs towards sin. Because that's what he wanted in the first place, is to be able to run towards sin. But he even asked his father to fund the trip, which is incredible. If you get this as a story about God... And that we would take God's blessing to fund our trip as we run into sin and away from everything that God would want. And that person isn't running away because, I mean, it's just obvious rebellion. He thinks it'll be fun. And it actually will destroy him. Sin always takes you further than you want to go and costs more than you ever want to pay. It will cost him everything, his self-worth, his dignity, his self-respect, everything, his relationship with his family. Because we don't want to obey. And it makes him unholy. It removes him from his father. He is unforgiven. And we cannot be near God. And God can't help because of where we put ourselves, we put ourselves too far away. The Father does not come looking. The Father stays and waits for the Son to return. But he does not go looking. And so God's no longer our loving Father. Because we left. We ran away. And the most loving thing that God can do is send a fish or a famine after us. And either one of those is going to make a difference in how we see God and that maybe there's a need for God or a need for a father. And we decide we're going to come back, that we need him. 
because you cannot run away from God. He is the place where you need to be. It isn't that God can't reach you. It's that he won't reach you if you decide you're going to run away from him. There's a third story that is not as familiar. It is found in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is one of the people who, after Israel had been, after Judah had been taken captive, Nehemiah is captive in another land. And he actually comes back to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And the walls by chapter 6 are finished. It's all done. They've had enemies this whole time. Sanballat and Tobiah have been there to discourage, to do everything possible that they could ever do. And yet they have still managed to build the walls. They have built with a brick in one hand and a sword in the other. But he has encouraged the people and they have still managed to build the walls. And they keep sending people to him saying, Let, let's meet together. And he says, I don't need to meet with you. Let's meet. It's almost like advertisers. You know how it is. You can't get away from them. Let's meet together. I need to meet with you. You're in danger. There's all these things that are going to happen. He goes, I'm busy. I don't need to meet with you. And so you find that all the way through the first part of the chapter. It says in verse 10, Now when they went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Metabel, who was confined to his home, he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. But I said, Should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I won't go in. And I understood and saw that God had sent him, had not sent him, and he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Sambalat, Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. And his purpose, for this purpose he was hired, that he should be afraid and act in this way and sin. And also they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, O oh my God, according to all these things that they did, for they also, and also the prophetess Noida, and the rest of the prophets who wanted me to make me afraid. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul in 52 days. It's an incredible story of what Nehemiah does. And there are so many times where people want to give us advice. They want to keep us safe. They want us to protect us because, after all, somebody's out to kill you. Somebody's going to get you. And he's finished with the walls and he's hanging the gates. And he says, we'll come into the temple. We'll hide in the temple. They'll never be able to get you in the temple. Well, only priests can go into the temple. It's not me that gets to go into the temple because I won't live if I go into the temple. And so he realizes this is complete disregard against God. And these people are just posing as friends when they're actually enemies and they've just been hired. But I like his comment on this. Should a man such as I run away? Interesting, huh? How do you see yourself? What do you believe about yourself? Are you the kind of person who would run away? And if the answer is no, then why would you do that? Or, or maybe if you ask that question, you say, yeah, I'm a person who just runs away. That's all I am. And anytime anything gets a little bit difficult, I'm out of here. But Nehemiah sees himself that way. And he goes, you know, I'm not a coward who runs away. And so if they're going to come and kill me, then they're going to come and kill me. But I am not a person who runs away. And so sometimes we need to have that kind of strength. They've been fighting for 52 days straight. They've been building for the same amount of time. He knows God didn't send him. We need to look at who we are and have some actual confidence in who we are and realize that, you know, bad things are going to happen no matter what. No matter what you do, no matter where you are, it's not a matter of, of trying just to be safe. Act like a person who isn't afraid. And realize I'm not a person who runs away. Because we see that all the time. We hear this. Other people who want to influence our decision and tell us you've got to be safe, you've got to be careful. 
we need to be safe is sometimes the highest priority that we've got is just be safe. And so they build the walls, they have guards, they have security systems, they have alarms. You know, don't go hiking, be careful, don't climb, don't play. You might fall and gash your head open. And sometimes you are going to fall and gash your head open. Is that any reason not to do it? Every mom says, well, yes. And every kid says, well, no. Really? It might be worth it. Because yes, at some time you're going to get hurt. You're going to fall. It's going to be bad. It heals, right? I don't still have to wear that thing. I mean, that day was pretty bad, but uh, I still don't still have to wear it. Nice little three-inch gash up here, but, you know, you get over it. You mend. You heal. You go on. You forget. Just go and do what God wants you to do. Because people will tell you the th same thing. Don't love anyone or you're going to get hurt. And you are. But it might be worth it. Don't forgive anyone because they're going to let you down. Don't trust anyone because they're going to fail you. But it might be worth it. Because God does not make us to be afraid. People who are afraid are more like Israel when they see giants, when they are trying to go into the land. It's how they see themselves. The guys are big, yeah, but we see ourselves as small. Or when they face Goliath, we see ourselves as small. David says, that's because you're trying to fight with a sword. You need a 45 caliber slingshot to be able to go to this battle, and then it's not a problem, is it? Size isn't the issue. And so fear can influence people. We cannot let other people make us afraid or let fear control us. Failing is not the worst at this stage. It just means you go down swinging. Safe is not the most important because fear destroys your faith. And there ought to be times when we take risk and there ought to be times when we do things. Do not be safe in your faith. Now, be safe in your person. I'm not trying to say take crazy risk or anything. But sometimes your faith is going to demand that you take some crazy risks. Like forgiving some people, like loving some people, like doing some things that are really beyond your comfort zone. But they're worth it. And the last one we want to talk about today is found in John 10. Jesus talks about being the good shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, and he leaves the sheep and he flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. And he flees because he's a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. And just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. The hired hand takes care of the sheep, same way the shepherd would. They need water, let me lead them over here to water. They need pasture, let me lead them over here to pasture. They need grass, they need rest, they need a place. And the hired hand does all of it the same as the shepherd, except for one thing, when danger comes. And when danger comes, then it's a whole other issue. It's a whole other matter. And they're not really sure that, yeah, I don't want to do that. Because when the wolf comes, there's a danger. <laughs> for him then, it's just a paycheck. I didn't sign up for this. I don't want to get eaten. He doesn't care about the sheep. It's just a job. You see, a lot of people are willing as long as nothing goes wrong. You ever heard that before? Well, if it goes bad, I don't want to be in charge of anything. As long as it isn't hard and it doesn't take too much time, well, then, yeah, I'll help. But, you know, if it's going to be difficult, well, 
as long as I can still be safe, as long as no one hurts my feeling, as long as and the wolf comes and the danger comes and you know they're going to be there and he snatches the sheep and scatters them because you need someone of courage there. Not someone who runs away. The hireling is nothing invested. It isn't a permanent job. It wasn't something he wanted. It was just going to be part-time anyway. And he can quit any time. When the going gets tough, we quit, right? Isn't that the way it works? Not my sheep. Doesn't really care. Not my fight. Just need to be safe and save myself. Failing at this point destroys yourself. Because you don't have anything permanent. You've never stood for anything permanent. You've never kept anything permanent. You've never said, this is my own. This is worth dying for. This is what I want to hold on to. And the point is, sometimes we don't care. Not my sheep, not my fight. To follow Jesus, you need to care. Because the same thing says Jesus lays down his life for the sheep. He lives by faith. He is in constant danger from the crowd, from the mob, from Pharisees, from the Sanhedrin, from the council. There's no sin to be found in him. He lives in the presence of God. And he's already been through the danger. And he asks us to take up our cross. Right? Never did he say, I've already been through it all, so now you don't have to. No, when Jesus saw the sheep were in need, he laid down his life on purpose. That's the good shepherd. And when he speaks to us, he says, you take up your cross and follow me. At some point, you're going to fail. At some point, it's going to hurt. At some point, it's going to be dangerous. It will be worth it because of who it makes you. Then you can say, I'm not a man who runs away. Why would I do that? This is God's church. If you came in here to hide from God, you came to the wrong place. Because this is God's church. This is a place where God lives. When God calls, we answer. Jesus is the one who's already shown us. This is where you need to go. This is where you need to be. You can't run away from God. He can send a fish for you. But you're not here by your own design as if you're the one who's made all the choices and all the decision. I think there's a bigger design for that. And maybe it's that God wants you here and he's made you to be here. And you can't really avoid and you can't run away. Because you can't run away from God. Such an interesting parallel because Jesus will actually use the story of Jonah. Right? Matthew 12. Just like Jonah ran away, so Jesus runs. No, that's not the right part. Hmm. How is Jesus going to use the story of Jonah? Jonah. As Jonah was afraid, and no, Jesus was not afraid. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You don't get away from it. You're going to be in a fish, or you're going to give it for God. But either way, it's still three days. And I think Jesus is drawing the parallel there, saying, you know what, you can run away and try and get away from it all, but you're going to have to give up your three days. You're going to die. You're going to have that place where danger comes, where it's all there. Better to stand and say, I love God. Better to be there for him. Better for that to make all the difference. Experience his presence is about Jesus because Jesus is the one who gets us there. 
He's the one who paid the price. He's the one who died on the cross. He's the one that forgives sins. And he doesn't say you will get it all for free. He says you take up your cross and you follow me. Because this is a life of courage. This is a life where we live on purpose for God. We don't just run away. And maybe you're at the point where you've been fighting with a lot of things and you felt like running away. Not the right option. We want to be able to pray about it. We want to be able to bring it to God. We want to say, God, you're the one that can fix everything. I don't fix it by running away from it. And so that is the thing that makes all of the difference. This morning, if we can help you do that, to bring you closer to God, would you come while we stand?